I think for most people, the word turbulence is associated just with a bumpy flight. It can make the difference between an enjoyable start to your holiday or one of the worst experiences of your life. I think we've all been there when the plane starts to move around, the pilot puts the fastened seatbelt sign on. But normally, things you know, return to normal within a, a few minutes. But maybe we've all had at least one experience of extreme turbulence, where you think the plane's dropping 3,000 feet, even though it's probably hardly moving at all. The pilot now tells the cabin crew to sit down. And, you know, I'm an aerospace engineer. I know how these planes are designed, and I know the kind of safety factors that go into it. But even I have a limit when I'm looking out the window and I think, should the wing really be bending that much? But today, I want to talk about the deeper meaning of turbulence and how it defines the world around us. You see, turbulence shapes the planes that we fly on, the cars that we drive in, and even our own bodies. The problem is it's quite hard to see, but if you look carefully, you can quite often see it in the smoke from a cigarette or a candle, or even on your breath on a cold morning. But what is turbulence? Well, it really describes the way that a fluid behaves. And by fluid, I mean air, water, or even blood. It's best if we see from an example. So you see here the smoke coming from a candle. At the beginning, you see kind of a regular smooth flow that follows just one path. We call this laminar flow. But then you start to see these instabilities. You start to see this random chaotic flow start to form that now we call turbulent flow. And Turbulent flow is something that really is the norm in nature. It's something you see the most. But all fluids can be in a laminar or a turbulent state, and they transition between them depending on the speed or the viscosity, how sticky the fluid is, uh, or even external factors. But one of the key things with turbulence is the way that it mixes things up. And so if you imagine if you put like a dye trace, some sort of colorful liquid into a flow, in the laminar region, it will just carry on going in the kind of the same path. But once it gets into this turbulent region, then it really starts to be mixed and turned around until that the dye is spread much wider than it was before. And this is the reason that turbulence is actually desired when we want to cool down something. We want to spread coolant around. Inside a nuclear reactor, they actually design the, the geometry for the, the pipes which carry the coolant to promote turbulence or inside a jet engine for the, to cool down the turbine blades. But turbulence also has some disadvantages. It tends to cause more resistance, more drag. So if you're designing a plane or a car, you want to minimize it and, in general, have as much laminar flow as possible. This means you have less drag, you can use less fuel, and you're more efficient. That's why usually when I ask somebody, oh, you know, if you want to draw a car or a plane, you tend to do something quite smooth and streamlined. But if that's the case, then why do golf balls have dimples? Probably if I asked you to design something that could go as far as possible, you'd make it smooth and slick. But that's where our understanding of turbulence comes into play. So if we were to now look at a smooth sphere, so imagine a golf ball with no dimples. What I'm showing here is a visualization of the flow going around that ball. So what happens is the air moves over the ball. Imagine you've just hit it. Um, and the flow starts to slow down as it goes around the sphere until you get this separated flow around the back, this wake. And this wake is what's causing a resisting force, a drag force. It's what's slowing it down. But now if you put dimples on the ball, you start to see that the wake is much smaller. And that's because of the way that turbulence acts. This mixing that we saw with the dye actually helps it to stay attached for longer. The flow has more energy and momentum, and so doesn't give up until later around the ball, has a smaller wake, and actually has almost half the drag. So if you were to hit a smooth ball, it would only go about half the distance that a, a proper golf ball will. So that's kind of the interesting thing about turbulence. You know, it's kind of the opposite way that you'd think about how to do things. But you know, that's just golf. I mean, that's kind of interesting for some people, but it's not really world-changing stuff. I think really the important thing 
or the reason that we need to know more about turbines is actually climate change. So countless studies have shown now that humans are responsible or partly responsible for climate change. And, you know, the problem is, is that it's only going to get worse. And I'm talking now about the contributions from aviation and, and automotive. Because as the emerging economies, China, India, Brazil, want to increase their use of planes to the way we do, we're going to see a big increase. But like so many things, once you have the technology, do you really want to give it up? Do you want to swap the ability to fly from London to LA in 10 or 11 hours with going on a boat across the Atlantic for five days and then a car and a train? Of course you don't. So it's the responsibility of scientists and engineers to come up with ways to reduce the impact. And one of the key ways of doing that is aerodynamics, because you know, the plane's flying through the air. If we make it go through the air just that little bit more efficiently, we can use less fuel, less power, and reduce the emissions. Now, I thought it's always good to have, you know, some equations in. It's kind of, you know, I've, I've got to prove myself. I have the doctor before the name and all that. Um, but really, the, it's because if we want to design better planes, cars, we've got to understand turbulence. We've got to really be able to try and model it, visualize it. So about 200 years ago, two mathematicians came up with the Navier-Stokes equations. And these, if solved, can exactly represent the motion of any fluid. We can get out its speed, its direction, and the force it imposes on the body that it goes through or around. But the problem is, even though these might look quite simple, they're not. They're very complicated and nonlinear, such that you cannot solve them by hand, analytically. So instead, we have to use numerical methods to approximate them, and we use supercomputers. If we can do this, then we can start to visualize the flow. So here's an example of a simulation that I ran a couple of months ago, solving these equations on a supercomputer. And here we see the flow around a racing bike. The red is the fast-moving flow, fast-moving air, and the blue is the slowest, like we saw on the golf ball. Now, here you can actually see the turbulence. You can see these structures coming off the back of the helmet, back of the rider, and you can see how this company can change the shape of their bike to reduce these regions. It's also why you see cyclists go into that tuck position, because it reduces the amount of separation behind. But to do all this, we have to use supercomputers. But what is a supercomputer? Well, I think most people tend to think of a supercomputer as some kind of big, fast version of their own PC or laptop. And that's not strictly true. It's best to really think of it more as a collection of computers, all working together in parallel. And here's an example of a computer in Barcelona. It's called Mare Nostrum. It's actually held within this beautiful chapel. And you can see all the different rows of machines, which essentially are just collections of your own PC, but just working together. But sometimes it's hard to understand how they're used. So the way I like to think about it is, if I asked you to try and, I don't know, write a book, and I give you a 1,000 pages of handwritten notes and ask you to type it up. Now, it might take one of you, I don't know, three weeks, a month, to type up a 1,000 pages. But instead, how about, instead of asking one person, how about I ask a 1,000 people, but just to write one page? Now, it might take one person to write a page half an hour or an hour. So if a thousand people are doing this simultaneously, then instead of one person taking a month, it's only going to take the time it takes one, because they're all doing it at the same time. They communicate it back to me. And this is exactly how supercomputers work. It's essentially splitting up the task into little, uh, little problems and, and letting the supercomputer do it. Basically, we have tried to understand turbulence. We're trying to adapt the, the flow. But nature's beaten us to it. You know, a lot of the reason why we look the way we do, or, or animals and fish or mammals, is because they need to be able to deal with, with turbulence. It's, it's all around us. So for a whale, if you look carefully, you can see on that side of the fin, there are these tubercles, these kind of undulations. 
And for a long time, we didn't really know what they did. And it's only really once we've had this power of supercomputing and understanding turbulence, we figured it out. And so they act a little bit like a golf ball does, in that they generate these vortices, this flow, that move over, if I had a laser pointer I could show you, they move over the, the, the fin and allow it to stay attached for longer. It stays more efficient. And what that means to the whale is that it can maneuver more easily under the water. But what's for me really interesting, as someone who used to work in Formula One, is how these designs have inspired engineers to try and take it into their own. So if you look carefully here, in between the two words of a sponsor that I can't say, you can see that these little undulations, that's trying to do exactly the same thing that the whale is doing. For the Formula One car, it tries to give lower drag and, and more lift or more downforce. So this is one, and there are hundreds more examples of the way that animals inspired uh, engineering now. So I hope the next time that you're on a plane and you experience that bit of turbulence, that you start to perhaps understand a bit more what's going on. You see, the turbulence that you experience on a plane has quite often been generated by the flow coming over a whole mountain range. So you, just as we saw on the bike, the flow went over the back of the guy's helmet uh, and then separated the back and we saw this slow flow. The same can happen over mountain range. The flow comes over and for miles and miles and miles you have this turbulent, chaotic, random flow. And so, of course, if a plane flies into that, the plane is not really operating in the, in the right conditions or what it's designed for. But it's not happening exactly in the same place at the same time over the wing. So what you tend to find is it loses a little bit of its lift, which means it drops a bit. But because it's doing it in different parts of the wing, that's what creates that kind of bumpiness feeling you have. As soon as the, the pilot manages to, to move out of that region, things return to normal. So I hope that you've managed to get some deeper understanding of turbulence and the way that it shapes our world. It's not just about the turbulence we experience on a, on a plane. And I hope that you'll maybe now start to see turbulence in places that you didn't expect to see it before. So thank you very much.